You know when you're playing a Pokemon game and you run into something weird and pretty cool, but it's so small that probably no one would care? Well, I decided to track down the most obscure and unheard of cases of this. My name is Finn, and this is part 10 in my series of searching for the most obscure Pokemon knowledge I can find and bringing it to you. The goal of this video is to surprise even the most hardcore Pokemon fans who think they've heard it all, because I promise, you haven't. And I do just have to say we're getting so close to 100,000 subscribers and I know it's cliche, but the vast majority of my viewers aren't subscribed. So if you genuinely want me to keep making these videos and you want YouTube to keep showing them to you, subscribing would be freaking awesome. But anyways, let's do this. So this first one is a perfect example of something I think is incredibly interesting, but so small I wouldn't usually use it in my main Pokemon Fact videos. This oddity takes place in Pokemon Emerald and wasn't discovered or documented until 2021. So the Battle Pike was an area inside the Emerald Battle Frontier that challenged you to go through seven fights in a row. Well, when challenging the gentleman NPC, he has a Dusclops that attacks you with Ice Beam as soon as you enter. And there's something incredibly strange that can happen here. When Dusclops attacks, if you do not press the A button whatsoever, it will Ice Beam you while the man tells you to watch out. But if you press A during when this happens, you will get an extra line of dialogue where the man yells for his Dusclops to stop. If you go to the library in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl and read this book, it says, please don't be mad, I need to pay my bills. What the heck does that mean? Oh, it's a sponsor. This video is sponsored by Honkai Impact 3rd. Honkai Impact is a free-to-play third-person action RPG game on PC and all mobile devices. You play as Valkyries who fight against Honkai, whose goal is to destroy humanity. I personally really love diving into the world of whatever game I'm playing, and Honkai Impact really takes us to the next level. They even have tons of animated shorts that give these characters tons of development. And the quality of these genuinely shocked me. Speaking of characters, the game's 5.6 version just released and the new character part of Felice is super dope. I mean, she literally has an attack where she summons a giant cat. It's kind of amazing. The combat is genuinely super fun, and if you're into the collect-a-thon aspect of Pokemon games, there's tons of outfits and characters to collect. With a code in the description, you can get 30 crystals, 2,888 Asterite, and a Hersher trial card to get you started. Thank you, Honkai Impact 3rd, for supporting the channel, and now back to the video. In Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, on the first floor of the basement in Victory Road, there's a ledge near a ladder that if you jump over, forces you to go on a long path to get back to your starting point. But what's interesting is this ledge is only like this in the Japanese and English versions of the game. In the Spanish, Italian, French, or German versions, the ledge is actually cut in half to prevent this annoying detour. In Mahogany Town, when looking at the map above, I want you to take a closer look to see if you can find the one error in the design of this town. I'll give you three seconds. Do you see it? The error is actually that this tree over here has the top of it slightly cropped off, seemingly for no reason. In Gold, Silver, and Crystal, the move Sonic Boom uses two different animations between the international and the Japanese release of the games. But what's weird is that the Japanese version uses the same animation that went on to be used for Sonic Boom ever since Generation 2, but interestingly, the international version uses the animation for Gust seemingly for no reason, only to be reverted in every single game since. This next fact, I have a few mildly interesting sprite errors from Generation 5. The first is Slowbro. When you watch Slowbro's animation in battle, you can see how the entire face of its shell is slightly obscured. But when you look into the code of the game, you can find the character sheet and see that the shell actually doesn't have a left eye like it's supposed to. It seems they just didn't bother adding it because it wouldn't have been in view during Slowbro's animation. But when you watch Slowbro do its little dance a few times, you can easily tell we should be seeing part of an eye here, and it's a little off. 
A second funny sprite mix-up is Arbok. It's hard to tell, but Arbok is actually missing a tail segment. You can see there should be a small line right here, and we can actually confirm that this is an error, because we can actually see the back sprite has the missing tail segment. And one more sprite issue in these games is Darmanitan. When in Zen mode, you can see its back is completely blank, even though it's supposed to have squiggly marks on its back just like regular Darmanitan does. And you can see the marks appear in the anime and every single game since Generation 5. It seems they just left it out of the original sprite design. In the Korean version of Pokemon Gold and Silver, when you use the move Thunder, there will for some reason be an extra space between the word lightning and the exclamation point. This was actually found by Chikasaurus, who has a ton of little discoveries like this on her channel. If you hack in Pokeballs meant for the bug catching contest called Park Balls into your game of gold, silver, or crystal, it will cause a pretty funny little glitch. When throwing the ball, it will get stuck in the bag screen and attempt to catch a jumble of text instead of the Pokemon but it will immediately go back to normal after the next turn. The move Retaliate is a 70 base power normal type move, but possibly at one point may not have been. If you get the TM for Retaliate in the Japanese version of Black or White, you can see that the icon is the icon used for dark type TMs, implying that Retaliate was originally planned to be a dark type move. But the move Rock Smash also uses the Rock Type TM icon for some reason in Gen 5, so maybe this is nothing. Throughout the history of Pokemon, there was only one that I think Game Freak most likely regrets creating, and that Pokemon is Diglett, and here's why. Throughout the series, Game Freak has had to maintain the continuity that this Pokemon does not come out of the ground. Every single sprite of Diglett depicts it surrounded by mounds of dirt where it's dug up. Not revealing the bottom half of Diglett to the player is the entire point of this Pokemon, and the reason we have this. So showing what Diglett looks like underneath is forbidden. But because of this, they were suddenly tied into this continuity-wise. And there's a funny few quirks that are a result of this. In the Pokeathlon, there's a jumping mini game, and while Pokemon have different levels of jumping ability, Diglett is the only one who literally does not move. This renders it completely useless in this mini game. Sometimes you have to jump to score points and hit discs, and Diglett just will not. And then when we move to the Hurdle minigame, Diglett just simply ducks under the hurdles instead of jumping over them. And when you enter Diglett or Doug Trio into the black and white musicals, normal Pokemon will dance and jump around, but obviously for Diglett, it will just glide around and spin. It's kind of magical. But the problems don't even end here. One incredible detail in Generation 5 is that the Pokemon have weight. When throwing out a strong, heavy Pokemon, it slams down out of the Pokeball. And all Pokemon have this slight falling animation when thrown out to some degree. All of them, except for Diglett, who just weirdly fades onto the screen. As you most likely know in Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, HMs were replaced by secret techniques with all new names, and the technique for Flash is now called Light Up. But in the early demo build of Let's Go, Light Up was called Shine, but only the first time you received it. After that, it was called Light Up again. So it seems like Shine was scrapped almost immediately, but it was there. And one last interesting detail about this Let's Go prototype is that there was a very different intro cutscene that shows your character holding a Pokemon plush. And here it is. It's kind of an interesting view into how much getting your first Pokemon actually matters in the Pokemon world, which makes me a little sad that it was cut. In the code of Pokemon X and Y, there's unused data for a key item called the Clothing Trunk. It seems like it would have been a key item used to change clothes anywhere you go, but this concept was simply just reworked into the dressing rooms in Pokemon Centers, but then came back in Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. A mildly interesting detail in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver is the fact that certain Pokemon that are usually unencounterable have held items. Items that you will never see because it's impossible to even encounter the Pokemon in the first place. An interesting example of this is Shaman, Mew, or Celebi, which were all never catchable by normal means in Heart Gold, but for some reason are all coded to have a guaranteed chance of holding a Lumberry. 
Another weird one is Castform, who has a 100% chance to carry a Mystic Water, and Jirachi with a 100% chance to carry a Star Piece. Speaking of Jirachi, there's another interesting thing about this Pokemon you may not have heard of. If you happen to be someone who purchased a copy of Pokemon Channel for the GameCube in Europe or Australia, you might know that you can receive a Jirachi directly to your Generation 3 cartridge. And one little useless but kind of funny detail is that when talking to Professor Oak about receiving Jirachi, if you decide to just say no, instead of ending the event right there, a cutscene will play of Jirachi floating away, which is pretty goofy. But I actually have something even more interesting about this to mention. When researching this Jirachi, I found out you could only get it after beating the entire game of Ruby or Sapphire, and that's a hell of a lot of time. If you were speedrunning this game as fast as possible, it would take you around 4 hours just to get this thing. And you know what else would take you at least 4 hours? Beating the entire Pokemon Channel video game, which you have to do in order to receive Jirachi. That includes watching multiple anime specials, some even dimly projected onto the night sky with the opacity churned down to about 4. But after you do that, Jirachi's yours. And after learning about this, a question hit me. Can this thing be shiny? Well, no. But okay, I lied actually, yes. This thing was supposed to be shiny locked, but due to a programming error, is fully shiny huntable with a 1 out of 8192 odds. And that got me thinking, has anyone ever actually found one of these legit? And no, not a single footage of one exists out there legitimately found. Not even a shaky cam picture and certainly not a video. This is a shiny that has never been found to our knowledge, which I find to be incredibly fascinating, and I personally think is the rarest obtainable shiny Pokemon. And this is precisely why. Like I mentioned before, you can only receive this Jirachi if you have beaten an entire Generation 3 game. But you can't just simply save and reset your game to receive it after you've done this. You can only receive one Jirachi per save file. If you've caught on by now, this means that in order to shiny hunt Jirachi in this way, you would have to beat the entire game of Ruby and Sapphire for every encounter. And then you would do that over and over and over and over again, with the lowest possible shiny odds in the history of Pokemon. Finding the Pokemon Channel shiny Jirachi is something that would undoubtedly take you years, but yet is entirely possible for anyone with enough sheer will. Something about the world's rarest obtainable shiny Pokemon being right there in front of our nose waiting for someone to claim it is incredibly fascinating, and I really hope it shines for a lucky person soon. In Pokemon Ruby Sapphire and Emerald, on the second floor of the Sky Pillar, there is a cracked floor tile that if you stand on will crumble and land your player on a rock. A rock that is usually a background element and you cannot usually stand on. This does absolutely nothing to your game and you can simply step right off, but uh, yeah, that's it. Can't get back on unless you do it again. And it doesn't do anything when you're on there either, but uh... You know, it's kind of cool. I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, you clicked on the video, you knew what you were getting into.